Hi, welcome to Audiobook Academy. This is a self-paced audiobook. There's no need to keep an eye on things. Just pay attention. Thank you for taking the time to listen. This is a book summary of The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell. There are a few people bobbing their heads and their feet are tapping as the music begins. Seats may be moved around a bit. The momentum is starting together. One or two people will eventually get up to dance. People rush to the dance floor as soon as it's open. As the crowd grows, they become a pulsating mass of people. The tipping point is a look at the factors that contribute to the spread of ideas and viral phenomena. If we return to Gladwell's dance floor analogy, have you ever noticed how often toddlers or young children inspire others to join the dance party? That's what Gladwell explores through epidemics. When the music begins to play, young children are unable to control themselves. As a result, others are more likely to join in on the fun because of their charisma and enthusiasm. A select group of people, according to Malcolm Gladwell, has the power to spread ideas and persuade others to join in. A key takeaway from Malcolm Gladwell's best-selling book is that we can make messages stickier by changing the context in which they are delivered. An insightful look at how things spread and reach critical mass can be found in The Tipping Point, which is a compelling read thanks to the author's engrossing style and thorough research. Using epidemiology as a guide, we'll also see how viruses can teach us about our human nature. As a result of the worldwide coronavirus outbreak, we've probably gained a better understanding of how pathogens spread. Writing in 2000, however, Gladwell was inspired by his reporting on the AIDS crisis. It was Gladwell's approach to look at viral trends from an interdisciplinary perspective, rather than the traditional one. In fact, the book's title is derived from the point on the virus graph where the curve increases exponentially, indicating the rapid spread of the disease. Most of us have flattened the curve ingrained in our minds thanks to COVID-19, which is our attempt to halt the severity of the tipping point. But what are the characteristics of an epidemic's characteristics? To begin with, they focus on the uniqueness of each person they work with. A virus is highly contagious, like the story of rice and the chessboard. You may have heard of this before? In the context of exponential doubling, this is a well-known story. A chessboard-wielding con artist allegedly approaches a king with a con and demands rice's payment. There is, however, a disclaimer. The con artist wants the king to place a grain of rice on the very first square of the chessboard. He wants two grains of rice on the second square, so he doubles the rice. On the third square, he requests that the rice amount from the second square be doubled, resulting in four grains of rice totaling one grain. The king doubles the amount of rice on each square he visits. Over one trillion grains of rice are due to the king by the time he makes it to square 41. When we apply this logic to how disease is spread, you can see how easy it is for a virus to reach epidemic status. Secondly, viruses are clever and can make small changes to protect themselves. For example, the amount of rice owed at the final square of the chessboard is about 460 billion tons. Viruses evolve in order to better their survival. When it comes to the influenza virus, a new strain emerges every year. Thirdly, viruses don't grow in a linear fashion. For example, the coronavirus COVID-19 is a novel strain. They're frightful because of their rapid rise from obscurity to epidemic proportions. And, as soon as the so-called tipping point is reached, the situation spirals out of control. How, then, do we apply our understanding of viruses and the tipping point to social epidemics? Extraordinary rises from everyday existence. To quote Victor Hugo, there is nothing more powerful than an idea that has come of age. But how do some ideas become viral? In his book, The Tipping Point, Malcolm Gladwell identifies three causes of social epidemics. Among them are the law of the few, the stickiness factor, and the power of context. The allure of the right one. Have you ever noticed that there are some people who always attract a crowd? Because of their charisma, or perhaps because they're well-known and well-liked, or perhaps because they're simply a source of wisdom. People talk about and spread an idea or a message, which is how it gets out into the world. To get it to critical mass status, you need the right kind of people spreading it. Exceptional influencers fall into one of three categories. These individuals have the ability to influence a large number of people because they are well-connected, persuasive, or well-informed. They are referred to by Gladwell as connectors, mavens, and salesmen in his book. Connectors are something you'll be used to. Everybody recognizes them as soon as they walk into a room. During an event, they engage in conversation with attendees and make their way around the room, exuding charm. Connectors are people lovers who excel at connecting with others and keeping those relationships strong. They may have weak ties in their lives, but the power of the connector is in their ability to build and maintain a network of acquaintances. There are many different social circles represented by the connector, 
so they can work in many different industries. Consequently, their diverse networks are priceless when it comes to disseminating ideas and messages. According to Connections Research, we're much more interconnected than we like to believe. In Sapiens, Yuval Harari talks about this, but even a novel experiment shows how quickly a message can spread. As demonstrated by the famous Six Degrees of Separation study, human networks are vast. Nebraska residents were given a letter to deliver to a New York stockbroker, which they were instructed to do. The goal was to get the letter to its final destination by handing it off to someone who could do so. Letters to the stockbroker typically took between five and six steps to arrive. The game Six Degrees of Kevin Bacon is another variation on this theme. The goal of the game is to connect a celebrity to Kevin Bacon in the shortest amount of steps possible. Gwyneth Paltrow and Kevin Bacon are two examples. Similarly, Brad Pitt and Gwyneth Paltrow starred together in Sleepers and Seven, respectively. In this way, Kevin Bacon and Gwyneth Paltrow are inextricably linked. Because Kevin Bacon has appeared in so many films and has worked in a variety of genres, the game works so well with him as a character in it. Everyone has a go-to person for book and music recommendations, as well as advice on what laptop to buy, who they turn to when told to ask an expert. Maybe you're a maven in your own sphere of influence? Mavens are experts in their fields, and we rely on their advice when we need it to be based on solid research. Mavens are kind and generous with the information they have acquired over the course of their careers. A recommendation from a maven, on the other hand, is not just hype and hyperbole, it is well considered and weighty. All of us have had some experience with salespeople at some point in our lives. They have the ability to sway others with their charisma and charm. Convincing and assertive are two ways in which they attract followers. As a result of their exuberance and swagger, they've earned quite the reputation. However, salesmen aren't just the people in the store trying to convince us to buy their products. We are often persuaded to make purchases by salespeople who demonstrate the superiority of their products. Salespeople are the first people to start dancing and the example of the first person to do so. Seeing what we are missing and what we could be getting out of it is what they do. Salespeople also use their bodies and body language to convey subtle messages to us. They may not along with us, maintain eye contact, or mimic us in subtle ways in a bid to entice us to join them in their conversation. People who work in sales have mastered the art of appealing to our emotions and getting the crowd excited about a product or service. Connector, Maven, and salesman can sometimes be necessary to make an idea go boom. A good salesman's weight may be all you need in other situations. A typical response to a question about whether or not hush puppies were cool in the early 90s would be, sure, they're cool if you're a grandpa. When a group of New York City teenagers began ironically donning them, things changed dramatically. Those in the know when it comes to the fashion world have probably already spotted this one. Hush puppies were popularized by mavens, who spread the word, and then by connectors and salesmen, who jumped on the bandwagon. As a result, Hush Puppies, a brand that was once considered a throwback, has become a household name. It's getting to be a problem. Chip and Dan Heath were inspired to write Made to Stick by Malcolm Gladwell's concept of stickiness in his book. According to the concept of stickiness, some ideas persist while others fade away. In a nutshell, what holds things together? A product or service must be sticky and memorable in order to catch on and succeed. What's your take on why nostalgia is so energizing? Because it's based on the best memories and stories, nostalgia is powerful. When was the last time you bought into something because of the allure of fond memories from your youth? It's not uncommon for the way a product or concept is presented to have a significant impact on how long people hold on to it. It's all about how we present something that has a huge impact on how much support we get. Knowing your audience is the most important part of any presentation. Knowing your target audience allows you to craft a message that resonates with them on a personal level. Sesame Street, for example, uses the power of stickiness to promote literacy among children, as illustrated by Gladwell. In contrast to what we've been led to believe, children aren't passive viewers of television, but rather active participants. They lose interest in a show if they find it boring or difficult to follow. Sesame Street's creators did extensive research into the show's appeal to children. In the first place, Psychologists recommended that writers keep humans and Muppets apart in order to preserve the line between the fantastical and the real. If children couldn't tell real from fake, they said, they wouldn't be able to distinguish between what was real and what wasn't. In contrast, young children preferred the interaction between humans and Muppets, and gained a great deal of knowledge as a result. Also, the creators realized the importance of using repetition and educational elements on the screen to help children retain more information. To put it simply, when presented to the right audience in the right way, 
The content of Sesame Street became extremely memorable. Everything depends on context. There is a common belief that we are a product of our surroundings. The reality is that the environment has a significant impact on our choices. A quiet park is a far cry from a crowded shopping mall. Both art galleries and schools have their own unique ways of exhibiting and viewing art. How we behave is profoundly influenced by our immediate physical and societal surroundings. The message or idea is received in a different way if the context is changed. Using Gladwell's broken windows theory as an illustration, theory suggests that the presence of visible crime, for example graffiti and broken windows, encourages more crimes to be committed. Streets should be kept clean so that people are less likely to engage in criminal activity. The theory has since been disproved, but it still provides useful information about human behavior. For example, if you walk into a spotless home, you're more likely to make an effort to maintain the cleanliness. Likely to abandon your shopping cart in a mall with shopping carts all over the place rather than wheeling it back to the trolley bay is another possibility. Behavior is also influenced by the social context in which it occurs. With whomever we're around, our demeanor changes. Do you know how you act around people you don't know, people you're close to, people you work with, and family members? Maybe you keep your language in check, maybe you slip into slang, maybe you only share inside jokes? Irving Goffman famously dubbed this behavior impression management. And he also said we navigate the territory between front stage and backstage behavior depending on who we're around. The Stanford Prison Experiment is a great example of this. It has been used as a case study in research ethics and was made into a compelling film in 2015 based on the contentious experiment. We accept the reality of the world with which we're presented, says Kristoff from The Truman Show in reference to the experiment, which had a group of college boys acting as either inmates or prison guards. Due to the guards' malicious behavior toward the prisoners, the two-week experiment had to be halted after only six days. The participants embraced their roles and acted in ways they had never imagined. Playing the prison guard role was enough to alter their normal demeanors and put them in a state of confusion. Is it always better to have more? As social beings, we naturally form a variety of social groups. Ideas spread easily within groups because members tend to be like-minded. A good example of this is book clubs. For the most part, Book clubs cater to a specific type of female reader who enjoys a particular type of literature. Because of this, it only takes one book club member to recommend a book to an acquaintance in a different book club to spread the word about a well-known author. The Yaya Sisterhood experienced something similar. If you look at things from a larger perspective, you can see how influential Oprah is as a book maven and how her Oprah's book club has been. However, group efficacy has a limit. If a group grows to more than 150 people, the rule of 150 asserts, that group will split into factions. In smaller groups, you can also take advantage of transactive memory. At dinner, you might say something like, where was that restaurant that we used to go to on vacation each year? Is this the place where they used to get their amazing homemade ice cream? Somebody is bound to jump in and remind you or fill in the blanks. Groups tend to have a collective memory, and this is often very powerful because individuals often lack the capacity to store sufficient information in their brains. Finally, I'll say this. Inventors who seize on a new idea can spread it far and wide. They're the risk takers who believe in the value of their own vision enough to put it forward to the rest of the world. The early adopters are then involved. As opinion leaders, they're often sought out for their expertise and know-how. They set the example for the rest of us. As soon as the general public joins in, it becomes clear how widespread the trend is. Something's mass appeal is what elevates it from the realm of the fringe to the center of cultural consciousness. The trend finally ends when the laggards join in. They're usually the final nail in the coffin of a trend's popularity. It's a fascinating and insightful account of human behavior in a world where we're increasingly connected and social media influencers are popping up everywhere. Furthermore, the book provides a fascinating look at why some things become popular and how to get people to join in on the movement, especially for important issues. When it comes to today's modern world, the tipping point provides a unique perspective. And the tipping point tells us a lot about the world around us and the people who live there. Thank you for listening in Audiobook Academy. Please don't forget to subscribe for more content like this. See you in next audiobook.